Hello, hello, this is Angela Raspis and welcome to episode 60 of the Your Next Chapter podcast. Now you may have heard the expression that necessity is the mother of all invention. And my wholehearted conversation today with the lovely Emma Vega Malta is a perfect example of the truth in that. Now Emma is an artist and a designer. She's got a 20 year background career in Europe and Australia. She grew up in England, graduated in London with a Bachelor of Arts in Fashion and worked in PR and publishing before moving to Switzerland where she had a little art studio. But now she lives in Sydney, Australia with her family and her business is called Bespoke Backdrops. And she's got a boutique design studio that specializes in creating really imaginative video backdrops and media walls. Now, I have been lucky enough to have one of these backdrops in my business for the last 12 months. And if you've seen any of my videos, you may have seen the backdrop that the gorgeous Emma created. She really has just such a, a beautiful way of bringing what is familiar in your business and in your brand right into that backdrop so that it really epitomizes your brand. And I absolutely adore my backdrop. But what did I mean by the mother of all invention? Well, being an artist is was a gorgeous, gorgeous way to be living. But what happened to Emma, and she's extremely open and vulnerable in this interview, which I always appreciate because it gives us such a great insight into the realities of building a business. Her husband had always been in that traditional role as providing for the family, but being in the money markets, there was that little old thing called the, the GFC, which really put their, their uh, family and situation in a very different place back uh, a few years ago. And Emma found that she needed to step up and become a stronger contributor to the family in a financial sense. Now, she was absolutely right for this challenge, but she needed to look at where in the market can the skills I've got meet a need? And that is when Bespoke Backdrops came to life. Now, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many different layers to the journey that Emma's been on that even took her over to Pitchfest in Silicon Valley. Quite an incredible story, and I know you're going to be inspired by it. But what I'm wanting you to do is to dig down into your own background and experience and think, how can I use my skills in the way that Emma used her innate skills? How can I either start a business with those skills, or how can I inject an infuse them more into the core of my business. One of the things Emma talks about is creating her perfect day, a visualization and a, and a writing out exercise where she really decided, what do I want my business to look like? And then she created it from there. So a really strong vision and a commitment to action and such an amazing amount of talent. It was one of those conversations I absolutely adored. Now, just one other thing, Emma has also given us a very, very handy download today. It's about how to create your brand and visual identity, how to extend it out into the marketplace. So you might like to jump in and grab that download as well, which you'll get by going to angelaraspis.com forward slash 60, that's six zero, download, and you'll be able to grab that brand and visual identity guide. But let's dive into this interview. I know that you'll find it as inspiring as I did, and who knows, maybe you'll even get one of those gorgeous and bespoke backdrops for your own business. Inspiration, clarity, confidence, and wholehearted business strategy. Welcome to Your Next Chapter, the podcast especially for women in their 40s and beyond who know that business and personal development go hand in hand. Tune in each week for marketing, mindset and personal growth strategies, along with inspiring stories from women around the world who are creating new businesses and lives that are personally fulfilling and financially rewarding. If you're looking to create a business and life you love, you're in great company. Let's find out what will unfold in your next chapter. I'm your host, Angela Raspis, and I'm so delighted that you're here. Well, my next chapter began a little earlier than before I turned 40. I moved from Switzerland to Australia when I was 37. And that really, looking back, was when my next chapter started, because my kids were a bit older, and I sort of took my business a little bit more seriously. 
So you began to take your business a little bit more seriously. That's an interesting concept. So up until then, I, I know that a lot of your background was your artistic skills. So what were you doing before, like before you actually arrived in Australia? How were you using that artistic skill? Was it more in a hobby sense or was it in a business sense before the next chapter started to loom? Well, it was... Um in a hobby sense, um, in one sense, I had a studio, an art studio at home, but I was getting paid. So it wasn't a hobby in the sense that I wasn't earning money from my art, but I had an art studio at home and I taught adults how to paint. I had some art classes for children going on at my home and at the, my children's school. Um, and I did exhibitions and I painted um, commissions for you know people's homes. But it really was at a hobby level because the money didn't really matter at that stage, but I was getting paid for my work. So when I, so I mean, when you moved to Australia, things started to change from there. Yeah. Then that, then I started realizing that I actually wanted to make the money count and I wanted to do something a bit more um, substantial with my art and see if I could build a business with it. I love that put that perspective of I wanted to make the money count. There is a difference in, in attitude that can happen with us. If, if we're in a scenario where we don't have to work, but we want to work, we want to use our skills. That's a very, a very fortunate place to be in, but it doesn't always stay that way. Sometimes circumstances can, can throw curveballs at us and we need to make changes. And from the chats you and I have had, I understand that there was a fin, a fin curve that was thrown your mate made you understand that not only did you need to step up but that you could step up could you talk to us about that my darling oh my goodness that was such a massive part of my life well everyone went through it um, was touched in some way by the global financial crisis it just happened to hit us really particularly hard because my husband at the time was working in a financial based um, industry he had his own company and um we were hit horribly and it wasn't, it, it happened overnight when Lehman Brothers went down and we thought, oh gosh, this is terrible. But actually the worst of it came a few years after, afterwards. It was like a slow burn, a slow descend into um, a lot of problems uh, for us financially, uh, my husband's business and all the sort of the repercussions that came from the GFC. And that's when I realized that, yes, I was earning money with my art and my business, but like I said, it didn't really count. And I realized that I wanted to take some responsibility for my family's income and my earnings. And that's when it kind of um, sort of really ramped up for me. That's when it all started. And I realized I had to do something to help. <laughs> And sometimes that um, necessity can be very, it can help us become very inventive when there is an absolute need and we need to stand up. Suddenly innovation can appear from left, right and centre. But how did it feel at the time? Did you, I mean, there is some of that um, talk around about making money from art is difficult, inverted commas. You know, there's that the starving artist wow. almost um, stereotype or, or legend that's yeah. there. But I mean, you definitely push that sort of concept aside. So, how, did you have any sort of mindset blocks or any concerns or fears? Uh, it's probably silly um, to ask such a question. Of course, there were some fears, but, but how did it feel when you decided, I'm going to make this work, I'm going to change this? It didn't actually, I wasn't actually ever afraid of earning money with, with through my art. I did never had that starving artist mentality. I always um, enjoyed getting paid and I didn't mind um, receiving money from my art. I didn't see that as um, you know, selling myself out. But what I did struggle with, with was you know, how much money was I able to earn and, and in a sustainable way that wasn't just an exhibition here and you know, a nice commission there, that it was more, had more longevity in it. And that's when I sort of thought, gosh, am I actually a business person? Even though I've made money from my art, I wasn't necessarily a business person. So I just uh, that, with that. And that's actually something that, that I hear a lot, both on the conversations and the podcast, but with my own clients as well. When you, it, it often hits when you have a modality, as in you're a, you're a um, nutritionist or a masseuse or a psychic or lots of other sort of things where it comes as a natural talent. And I would perceive you know, having that artistic ability it's innate to a degree. Obviously, you can develop it, but it's innate. And some people do struggle with the idea of, first and foremost, charging for what is a gift. So wonderful to hear that, that that's not something that you were struggling with. But then there's the other piece, which is that. 
how do I become a business person? I'm an artist and how do I transfer that and attach onto it as business skills that can create that sustainable income? So that's a, that, that part's a real challenge. So talk to us about where did your idea of turning your art into a sustainable business begin? Where did that first blossom out past doing exhibitions and commissions? It, it blossomed out when I moved um, from Switzerland to Sydney. I decided that I wanted to open a shop because I didn't know anybody. I had no friends, no contacts, nothing in Australia, except my husband was Australian. Um, so I opened a little shop and started selling my art printed onto fabrics. So I realized that if I could make art useful, then maybe people would buy it. Because although a painting is lovely and useful in its own right, I wanted to sort of see what other products I could produce with my art that would also make my creative skills useful. So I started um, printing my fabrics, uh, my, my designs uh, artwork onto fabrics and having chairs upholstered. So the chair became a really functional piece of art. And that's how I started sort of getting into business with my artwork, just beyond just exhibiting and selling my paintings. Oh my goodness, actually, um, you've just, um, this triggered such a memory, of course, that's, that's the first chapter that, in which I met you. I remember sitting yeah. on one of the chairs at one of the networking events that I went to and, and admiring um, the artwork then, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, exactly, that's how it all started for me in Australia. Um, uh, previous to that in Switzerland, I had had some chairs upholstered in beautiful fabrics with paintings on it. And I thought, my goodness, I can do that. So then when I came over to Australia, I think I landed on the 30th of July, 2010. And I think I had my shop open by that November, December. I'd already found printers for my fabrics. I kind of hit the ground running because that's another thing with setting up my business that was interesting that I didn't factor in is that in Switzerland, I had to speak French for pretty much everything. I mean, I had a, a huge expat community of friends, but if I was doing insurances or schooling or shopping or banking or anything, even my exhibitions had to be in French. So when I came to Australia and I could speak English with everybody, there was no stopping me. I just contacted printers and people and I just got things going really fast because I was so excited to be able to speak my mother tongue without having to second guess myself <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Oh, that would have that would have smoothed the pathway without a doubt. But I love your perspective there that you had. If I can make my art useful as well as beautiful, then that's going to broaden the market for what I can offer. So we went into the bespoke chair design. But then the, the, I, the story, the part of the story that I love here is how the evolution of your work. So you were doing the chairs and then you've moved on into another area. So talk to us about that evolution from there. And obviously the, the GFD and the necessity for you to step up further and create yeah. that more, again, that extra level of sustainability in your business. So how did you take the next step? Well, the next step came... Um it's like what comes first there's never anything that really comes first but I was trying to, I was trying to step up with earning um more money for for, for the family because we were going through some some really difficult tight tight moments and I realized that actually if I looked at my numbers of my business it wasn't actually bringing in very much money and the reason I knew that is because back in 2014 I realized I didn't know anything about the actual nitty-gritty of business so I thought what's the quickest way to learn about the real nitty-gritty and I realized that the tech startup industry has something called pitch contests and people pitch their startup businesses for investment and to be able to stand up on stage and give five minute pitch on your business you need to know your profit your loss your competitive landscape your business model you need Need to know everything about the nitty-gritty of business so I thought right if I put myself in that situation and pitch my chair business um, in front of a panel of investors at this competition the, the best thing that well, the worst thing that'll come out of it is I'll learn something about my own business I actually won the competition surprisingly and was sent to Silicon Valley so it was through all that catalyst of learning about my chair business, winning the pitch contest, going to Silicon Valley, you know, with the possibility of expanding into the States. But I actually looked at my numbers and I realized that I was actually just about breaking even with my business, even though I was charging for it and I thought I had a handle on, you know, my expenses and my costs. I wasn't really bringing in enough to support my family. And that's when I had a bit of a crisis and I thought I need to pivot do something 
that have a much um, wider profit margin, very lean, um, not flabby, spending money only when I really needed to spend the money. And that was the transition that that whole Silicon Valley thing really helped me transition to what I'm doing now and the business that I have now. There is an observation that I really have to make here, which was that the realism that you had, your ability to step back to evaluate what's going on in your business and to recognize it as a function that you could change. It's not a reflection of you as an individual. And it's like, oh, look, my business isn't going as well as it should. I'm not doing well. It wasn't that, that you recognize this, this was the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty as you describe it. And being able to make uh, a decision that undoubtedly had a little bit of emotion attached to it, but it was a business decision. And that to me is a real indication that you're crossing the line into I'm a business owner territory. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I don't think I ever would have crossed into that territory had we not had the, the family crisis, the sort of, um, mm. you know, what I would like to call the, the, the middle class taboo of admitting that you can't afford something. Because I have been blessed with my life I've lived a beautiful privileged life I've always worked hard but it's it's always been you know sort of this middle class sense of ease where the husband goes out to work and the wife might have a hobby or a, a small paid job but you know everyone kind of sort of fits in their own place and everyone knows where they belong in that system and all their friends are the same and we were in that system and I, and I really I'm still in it obviously but that came to that point where we had to say to our friends, I'm sorry, we can't afford to go and do this. Or, you know, we had to take our kids out of school. And that for me internally was, was really difficult. And it was that whole crossover period of saying, right, I need to step up as a businesswoman because I'm realizing the numbers aren't adding up and I need to help my husband out. We're a team after all. So that crossover sort of came in a very messy fashion and I don't think it would have happened had the GFC not happened so in a way I'm kind of grateful in a way um, that the GFC happened I of course a lot of me says I wish it hadn't happened because it, it was so traumatic for us but then I wouldn't have stepped out into the light and I wouldn't have had my you know next chapter as it were to be quite so <laughs> so good <laughs> But it's the classic, isn't it? I mean, we hear that that uh, that cliche often that every cloud has a silver lining. But this is a classic example where when you look back hindsight, you can see where the piece is connected and that what at the time was definitely an unpleasant, a traumatic, as you describe it, a real, um, a real smackdown to some degrees of life needs to change. But it was that pivot point for you. And that's, that's the phoenix rising aspect that I'm very much admiring at the moment, that there wasn't the, oh my gosh, woe is me, and, and life has changed and it's so unfair. There was a, okay, this is what has been delivered. I cannot change it, but I can take control of the situation and make changes now that are within yeah. my power. And that is hugely admirable. You know, hats off without a doubt. Thank you. Yeah, well, we, I did have some moments. Of, Why is it happening to me? But then I realised, <laughs> I, I did in that time as well. I was introduced to personal development and looking at yeah. things beyond, you know, the everyday and the black and white, and that really helped me. Um, and as they say, stepping, doing your own business is the biggest personal develop journey, development journey you'll do. And so, business kind of helped me personally as well as help the finances, as you know, together. So, business has been amazing, sort of journey. Oh my goodness. Me. It's so true, isn't it? Yeah, business development, personal development, they are absolutely entwined with, without a doubt. If you want to go into business, be prepared to grow, to change, to expand, to, to pivot, all of those things, because it certainly puts you through the ringer in good and sometimes not so good ways. Exactly. But so we're pivoting now. We're, we're seeing that the numbers aren't adding up. We've had that tremendous experience of getting to Silicon Valley. I mean, that must have been a great boost to your, to your self-belief in the, the way that you could look at your your talents and your abilities and your potential so now you're saying okay i need to pivot i need to create a business that is leaner and that can produce that more sustainable income with better profit margins etc cetera, etc cetera. these are my skills these are my talents where's the need in the market how can i bring those together and bring with me that creativity and passion which is a part of my skill set as well so we've got this melting pot tell me where the ingredients took you well when I came back from Silicon Valley, I wrote down what my ideal day would look like. 
And that's part of the personal development that I went through. And it, I realized that I just wanted to be spending my day drawing, painting, and being customer facing. Because part of the, the, the jobs that I was doing over in Silicon Valley was um, acting as like a CEO to expand my business, which meant I would never pick up a paintbrush again. I would never see a client again. And that really scared me. And it made me realize what I didn't want in my business. Um, so I realized I wanted to draw paint and design, uh, be customer facing and be paid well for it. So I actually set that intention that that's what I wanted to do every single day of my life. And um, it turns out that that's exactly what I'm doing now. I've been in bespoke backdrops has been sort of uh, around for just over two years. And that's what I get to do every day, but I had to set the intention to do it. And then interesting, the idea for bespoke backdrops came by not because I thought what a great idea let's do backdrops for people in business and videos is I was on in a Facebook group um the b-school Facebook group and someone was just saying hey I'm doing a webinar um and I want to have a backdrop behind me that isn't just my white wall do you know anyone that can do this and I, I like honestly those light bulb moments do happen from time to time I was hit by a thunderbolt of going my goodness I paint and design fabrics there is no difference in my skill set between painting and designing fabrics that are going to be printed and upholstered and, and put onto upholstered chairs than there is designing fabric backdrops. I've got my printers, I've got my suppliers all set up. I just need to sort of shift my marketing message and shift my, my, my focus. And it's nothing really has to change in my life. I just have a different set of clients. And that's how Bespoke Backdrops was born because I was listening to conversations in Facebook groups. Oh, there's such, there's such beauty in that. Number one is that you're listening and recognizing an opportunity. But if we even take that back a step when you were recognizing what you didn't want when you were having that, that Silicon Valley experience, I think we need to know what we don't want to then begin to form what we do want. And I love the way that you say it open. You know, I want to spend my days drawing and painting and designing and I want customer contact. You weren't prescriptive as to um, actually what we talk about in Notes from the Universe, that the cursed house. You stayed away from the cursed house and stayed open to what this opportunity, this utilization of your skills might look like. And when you're open in that way, I believe that's when opportunities can just literally go ping out of the wilderness and you recognize them and feel them. Absolutely. That's exactly how it was. I realized that if I sort of, um, you know, pigeonholed myself and said, I need to be, you know, doing chairs, I need to be doing upholstery fabrics, then I would never have been open to the idea of, you know, doing backdrops. So, so it's so important to, to know your skills and yes. know your desires and then look yeah. for the fit from there, but not be, as you're saying, not be prescriptive. That's awesome. Okay. So the opportunity came up, you saw the post, you went, Ding dong, ding dong, light bulb moment. I could do this. Tell us what, what happened from there. Well, then I thought, oh God, I don't know, you know, who would buy anything like this. I know there was someone asking for it, so it was clearly a market. The first thing I did, I thought, who do I know that's got anything to do with videos? And there was only one woman I knew um, in the same group that was doing um, iPhone video workshops. Um, and I just called her up and I said, what do you think of this idea? And she said, I think it's a good idea. And I said, is there anything I need to know about video? Is there any sort of, you know, aha moments or any sort of technical stuff that this might not work if it's fabric and an iPhone? And she said, no, nope, it would definitely work. And so um, she actually introduced me to my very, very first client. So it was by reaching out to someone and asking for help and asking for advice um, that I got my first client. And it just snowballed from there. Uh, actually, we often get when we're starting a business in, in those very early days, our first clients are most likely to come from some sort of a connection or a referral. It's, yes. it's, it's hot. A lot of people ask, you know, how do I get started? Where do they come from? And one of the pieces of advice that I always provide is to go out to your circle of influence, go out to your connections, go out to the people that you know, ask for help, ask for, for input, let them know what it is that you're up to and, yeah. and who it is that you're looking to work with. And bingo, so, so, so often that's where those first clients come from. So I'm glad to hear that that was the experience for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. It's, I think, Everyone's kind of scared of asking for help, but yet paradoxically, we're so happy to give help when someone asks us. Yes. So I thought, I'm just going to ask her, I'm just going to email her, call her up. And she was really, really happy to help me. 
and you know so that's set me up and if I hadn't asked I wouldn't have you know maybe got the first client where where she came from so yeah I'm glad I absolutely did. And I love the way that you recognize that fact that you enjoy to help. We all do. If we're given the opportunity to help, then it feels good. There has to be someone who gives. There needs to be someone who receives. So by not asking for help, you're actually denying someone else the opportunity for that good feeling, that feeling of goodwill and karma that they're assisting someone. So yay for asking for help. I think it's, uh, it's an important part of, of growth. <laughs> okay, so we've done the first backdrop. We've, we've taken our skills. We've utilized the existing um, structure infrastructure that you have, and you produced your first backdrop. Where did you go from there? It's very interesting to, to understand with the different you know, wonderful women speaking to is how did you begin to build your community and, and your list, you know, your client list from there? What type of things were you doing to, to build that list and to begin to generate leads past that first experience of the referral? Well, I was and I'm, I still am very active in closed Facebook groups so business Facebook groups and I had already had a bit of um, a standing in those communities through my chair business so people did know about me um, and so I just said in these Facebook groups hey guys this is what I'm doing now and I just told people what I was what I was doing and showed them the first backdrop that I did and lo and behold I got another you know email saying, Hey, am I really like what you did? Could you do it for me? So the first month of my business, I had one client, the second month of my business, I had a second client and it all came from me interacting in Facebook groups and being visible. Yeah. Having, having that community contact is important. And did you find, like you said, that people already knew you. So it's safe to say that it's important if, if you're going to bring in Facebook groups as a part of your overall strategy to the market, that you need to become a part of those groups, not just bounce in every now and then, but actually become a part of the community. Cause that being the, the, the essential name of the group. Yeah. Absolutely. Being part of the community, helping out. Someone's got a question, you know, you think you've got an answer to just, just pop in there, not looking for anything in return, just going in there to be useful because there's always going to be someone that will be useful to you. So yeah, just being visible in those communities was really useful. And I didn't even set out to do it strategically, right? I'm going to be visible in these communities. It just happened <laughs> naturally to me. And I realized the power of those communities. So this was back in 2015. 14, 15. Um, and I realized the community is, is really powerful. Even though we're all connected on technology, that sense of humanness is really important still, even with the mm, technology. And I guess that's an extension of one of the intentions you said as well with wanting that customer contact. Well, to me, if you, if you look at that from another perspective, that is community. You want to be in communion with other people. And so part of your strategy of being involved in communities and Facebook groups brings congruence between those two points. And that's an yeah. important thing for us to remember when we're marketing is to market in a way that that not only is, is giving you exposure to your most aligned clients or potential audience, but in a way that is a natural extension of the way that you work in the world. Like, I, I don't know how many times I've said it, uh, but I'll say it again on my podcast. Twitter is not my space. It's not natural to me to contain the way I communicate. You know, those short yeah. characters don't work. But, but Facebook groups, absolutely. I have a thriving Facebook, uh, Your Next Chapter community Facebook group. And being able to be in there and to share and to advise and to connect is really important to me. And it sounds like it is to you as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't even think of it consciously, but now you've put, spelled it out that way. That's exactly right. I love that connection with people. Mm, yeah, that, that, that's definitely your style with um, how I know you as well. And the fact I have one of your beautiful backdrops in my, in my business as well. And that was a great experience to, to go, that, go through that with you. So you're in these early stages of your business and you're finding that there is, there does definitely seems to be an interest. But how did you grow that into a demand? Because as I've seen, your business has definitely you know, evolved even through that point. It hasn't yes. been, it hasn't been, a, okay, I found the thing and this is it, I'm staying here. There's been an evolution as you have responded to the demands that the, the audience and the market is putting towards you. So talk to us about the growth from here. How have you planned or responded to those demands that are out there in the market for you? Well, I think the, the, the key words there is plan and respond. With my first business, the chair business, I planned everything to the nth degree and it wasn't, I wasn't very flexible with it. Whereas with the bespoke backdrops, I've responded. So my first client, I responded to what I learned with, with her and then brought 
that learning to my next client and the next client. So I didn't have a rigid idea of, you know, who my clients had to be, where I had to go. I really was really flexible with it. And I was lucky enough to be able to stay in the Facebook groups and realize that I, my clientele was very much at that time um, coming from Facebook. So I just responded to their questions like they would ask me. So, you know, how how wide is it or where can I put it and of course I didn't know the answers to that immediately some of the questions I would have to go out and find the answers myself and that then helped me build my marketing message um, for the next you know client that came along or the next post I had to do so I was very flexible about responding to what people were asking and what people were telling me and then building that into my business rather than having a very rigid plan Oh, that's, Emma, that is such a brilliant way of, of, yeah, responding to the situation. I mean, the, the ability to, to join the conversation that is going on in someone's head and then being able to share those words out into the market, not reinventing the wheel. If people are saying, I'm wanting and feeling this, this, and this, then turning around and sharing that with the audience, like that increases your chances enormously of connecting to other people who are thinking, feeling, desiring in the same sort of way. I love the fact that you recognize the need for that flexibility and to move away from that more rigid structure that you used to have. That, that to me is a perfect example of, of evolution, which is what we need at the heart of our business. Absolutely. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so we're, we're designing these backdrops and um, people are using them on video. You've been and, I, and you're getting those testimonials and feedback, which is such an important part of our businesses so that we can use that as the social proof and the credibility to attract more clients in. I think you start to see another niche within the market as you were responding to it and you've extended your business further. Yes, I have. Well, sort of a year and a half in to doing the backdrops, people started asking me if I could do branding work for them, which again, I didn't plan to do. But when I design a backdrop for a client, it's not just a sort of a step repeat logo or some graphic design work. I really get into what their business stands for, who they are, what their vision for the business is, how they want their clients to res respond to them and how they want to resonate with their clients. So I really sort of was doing that sort of branding deep dive for my for my backdrops for my clients so when I was ended up doing these backdrops for them they said oh my goodness this backdrop just represents me and my business and it resonates but actually my logo doesn't fit anymore and my Facebook cover doesn't work and I'm not quite sure about my my color palette for everything else I'm doing Emma could you help me with that so for about six months to a year, I, I offered that service, but didn't advertise it. You know, if I was chatting with someone and they mentioned it, I would say, oh, I can actually do your logos and I can do all kinds of other branding work. And then of January this year, I kind of made it official, put it on my website. Um, I, at this stage, had had some branding clients. So I already had testimonials. I had some work that I could, you know, pop on my website. And from, you know, day one, I got the clients that maybe didn't want a backdrop or never would be a backdrop client, but they like my work. They like my style. They like sort of interacting with me. And all of a sudden I offered them something useful. Like, Oh, I don't want a backdrop. Oh, but I do need some branding work done. And so I kind of extended that way. Yeah. That, um, that brand extension is, and that service extension of you seeing related things. It comes back to what you did right in the beginning when you recognize that if I could take my artistic skills and make something that's inverted commas useful, people will take it. And not everybody wants to be on video and therefore has that need for the, for the video backdrop, but everybody wants to have a brand that they feel connected to, that they feel projects um, who they are and, and, how, and what their style is out into the world. So again, another great example of responding to what the market is telling you, but not going, not going crazy. You didn't start doing, well, I can also paint your cars and no, I can also, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, be, a, be a stylist of how you should show up clothing wise and all that yeah. sort of thing. So there is parameters. On, on extending our services but again it's using that natural that's natural skill you have an extended area so how do you feel about branding piece versus the, the the backdrop piece so do you have as much love for that type of work as well I do actually because it's quite similar um, I go through the, exactly the same design process um, with my branding as I do with my backdrops the, pr the products are slightly different because the logo is different from a backdrop but the process is the same I use the same paint brushes I use the same paint pencils the same equipment uh, and the same thought process so I actually um, feel it's very aligned with what I do and I haven't had to change too much of my day so I really enjoy doing it 
Um, so it hasn't been too difficult to add that into the mix. And isn't it lovely because if you compare back to when you did that perfect day exercise and what you wanted to be doing each and every day, this is the same thing. It's just as you're saying, has a different outcome. So you're exactly. still, you're still, it's still connecting back, isn't it? Absolutely. How, how are you, how are you finding in terms of the business growth of, of need, like you, you mentioned before, uh, the importance of, of reaching out for help. So you did that when you were first doing your research and, and that's where your first client came from. But as the business begins to grow, as it has, are you finding the need to help, ask for help in other ways? Um, yes, I've, I've, I, I have a sort of small mastermind of women that I get together with once a month. Again, that sort of came by organically. We didn't plan it, but we meet up every month and we're all in very different industries, but we're at the same sort of level of maturity, I think, in our, in our business. And we just sort of, you know, bounce ideas off each other. So that's been really, really useful. Um, again, it comes down to community that's really helped me. I've had to also seek help with getting some of my systems and processes and sort of the, the back end stuff of my business organized because it grew to a point where I couldn't handle it just on a clipboard and a piece of paper anymore, which is how I started out, literally with a clipboard. One clipboard was jobs to do, the other clipboard was jobs done. So I needed to seek help to sort of build a structure into my business you know with software and systems and processes and things like that and that's been useful useful exercise do you, think, do you think that idea of um of uh, is there a particular stage like with women listening to us now whose businesses are perhaps in those early stages or or in that takeoff growth stage do you when you're looking back now see that there's a, a particular point when it is really useful to bring systems in do you think you brought them at the right time or with with hindsight would have you liked to have brought them in a bit earlier I don't think I would have wanted to bring them in a bit earlier. I had a mentor, a very brief um, period with this chap called um, Brad, who used to be Richard Branson's um, second uh, in command at Virgin many years ago. And he was my mentor very briefly. And he always said, and he wrote this in his book, you only change something when it's starting to break from your customer's point of view. So going back to my clipboards, I had a clipboard with jobs to do, backdrops to design, and a clipboard of backdrops done. And all of a sudden, my clipboard literally couldn't extend wide enough to, to take all the bits of pieces of paper. And I was getting confused between clients. It was breaking down to the sense that I wasn't serving my clients properly. And that's when I realized I needed to upgrade to a software that could help me organize my client projects. So literally I only sort of went down that path of doing systems and processes and spending money there when my actual system was at breaking point. I didn't try and preempt it by thinking, or oh, maybe in a year's time I might need this software so I shall buy it now. Um, because you might not need that software. You don't know what you need until you need it. So when my clipboards actually started breaking, that's when I realized I needed a system and a process in place that was a bit more streamlined. <laughs> Oh, and that's perfect. That's exactly what I was hoping that the conversation would lead to because my, my experience or my feeling is that especially because of the times we're in and all of the different tools and softwares and, and online bits and pieces that we could be using, I think they often lead to overwhelm in terms of all the things that I could use and could do versus what I actually need right now. So as, as you know, the old saying that my parents used to use, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, that's yes. essentially what you're saying there. Yeah. So you, you bring in systems just in time when they become a necessity or you bring in um, a new social media platform software or whatever the case may be, but you don't bring it in because you've seen it and heard about it and other people are doing it. You bring it in when it suits you, the stage of business and the stage of expansion where the demand is on. And I love that. I love that idea of, and let me see if I've got the wording right here, only change something when it's starting to break from your customer's perspective. Was that right? Yes, that's exactly right. That's what Brad told me. And it's really quite true. <laughs> start, yeah, I'm start. putting here, Brad said. <laughs> yes, Brad says, and he's right. Yeah. <laughs> so really simplicity. Well, the message that we're hearing here is, is simplicity. And, you know, as we're, as we're starting to bring this conversation to, to, a, to a close, this wholehearted chat, what I'm hearing very much from you is uh, looking at the skill set that you have 
uh, looking back at the different things that you've done throughout your life, whether it be a skill set in terms of an artistic talent as you have, but it could be any set of skill. It could be leadership skills. It could be organizational skills, you know, skills in speaking or inspiring others or whatever the case may be, that doing a little bit of an audit and seeing what you've got and then from there deciding to begin to research or explore where could there be a gap in the market where I could where I could find that my skills could fit this but most importantly how do I want to feel how do I want my days to look how do I want to work you know drawing up a little bit of that perfect day exercise to then begin to explore but not too not too narrowly not too I think prescriptively was the way that you described it so that you can stay open to the opportunities absolutely and 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 the first thing of that is to to acknowledge your skills and to know what they are and then be very aware of them and then opportunities will just sort of start popping up from unexpected places. <laughs> they do. And, you know, sometimes people find it difficult to identify their skills or to value those skills. Yeah. So, so in some ways, I mean, there are some great things that you can explore at Strengths Finder. We spoke about that actually on an earlier podcast. Yeah. But sometimes it's also not a bad idea to get feedback from those around you you know how do they see you what do they see your skills at as as being and and what are the things that people come to you for or have mentioned or you're so good at type thing have you have you explored that as a concept or have you had those sort of conversations with anybody to get that sort of perspective um i haven't had so much conversations with anyone about it but i do remember i i did a um gave a talk at a business conference last year and it was all about niching, finding your niche. Um, But I did talk about how you should find your transferable skills because just because you're good in one industry doesn't mean you can't take that skill and lend it to something else, which is I think perfect for your next chapter, you know, because, you know, we might've been, you know, working in corporate or mothers or doing, even just doing volunteer work while the kids were growing up. And now we want to expand to something else, just understanding, you know, those transferable skills that you can move industries quite easily with and asking other people, if you're not self-aware, to ask other people what they think is a really good idea. It can get, it can get the ball rolling, can't it, as we start to look around. And I, and I guess the other message which we've discussed here is to recognise that it is an evolution, that oh. things will move and they will change as you move forward. Yes. You spy those opportunities or you're, you're attracted to something else and you can explore that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. You've got to keep nimble and flexible and realize that everything is possible and, and sort of looping round to the, the beginning of our conversation where I had to step up. This next chapter really was about stepping up and supporting my family. It's, it's not been an overnight sort of um, success, obviously, but now I absolutely am contributing to to everything in the family and I didn't even think you know 10 years ago would I be contributing financially so wonderfully to the family and would it be sort of a useful amount and it just feels so great to be able to do that with all the ups and downs and the false starts and the dead ends and the tears and you know all that sort of stuff to come through it it's been really quite um quite amazing to look back at it actually and see how far oh, it's gone. I can hear that in your voice. I can hear the delight and the fulfillment in your voice. I can hear the smile as you're talking since yes. we're on audio at the moment. And it is, it's, it's extremely fulfilling. And, and I love how you're being very open and honest as well with that. You're from the outside looking in, we can often see an entrepreneur's journey, but we only see the results. We see good stuff. We don't, don't hear about often what the next story is. What was the catalyst that began the whole process? And sometimes that catalyst was not pleasant. It has, you know, that cloud and have that silver lining as you've experienced, but it takes time. You know, that first client didn't just fall off the back of a bus from, you know, oh, I put a, I put a tweet out and suddenly I was inundated. You know, it came, it came from connection. It came from reaching out. And there's been a gradual growth until you found your groove. And then it started to, you know, really extend from there. But that reassurance that you can take your skill set, you can turn that into a sustainable business if you're open and honest and I had a look at the fears, look at the opportunity to not take things as a personal, well, it's not working, therefore I'm not working. It's a case of what can I change? Being flexible and nimble. I love that description that you've just used. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a journey. 
<laughs> totally. Well, Madonna, I'd love to know um, when I'm coming to the end of these chats is that I'm a huge learner. I mean, I eat books for breakfast and, and I know a lot of the women in, in my community are, are equally as fascinated by books and stationery, by the way. That's another one. We all seem to love stationery. But if you're thinking about back on this, this personal or business, business development journey, has there been a book or two that have really helped you, you know, have that, that spark, that, that um, light bulb and that, that change that it's inspired? or it's helped you in a, in a particular way what would yes. you recommend that we go and grab off amazon i tell you uh, i started off having to work on my mindset so the mindset book that really uh, really helped me was um denise duffield thomas's um lucky bitch um series she had two books and she was talking about manifesting and mindset and and the idea of possibility and not being stuck in one place that you could move forward which is something i really needed to to hear back when I realized I had to step up to help my family out. So the mindset book was definitely Denise Duffield Thomas. Um, what else have I read? Oh, gosh, I've read so many books like you. They, they've all helped in, in one way or another. I do think um, reading books about the law of attraction, again, mindset, vibration, opening your ideas up to new possibilities. That's really helped me massively. Um, Gay Hendrick, The Big Leap. Everyone likes that. You know, how to sort of step up and move up in your life and not self-sabotage. Um, those three books really were quite pivotal for me. Um, mm. Gosh, there are so many books, aren't there? You know, they just go on and on. But the mindset stuff, oh, yeah. I really had to believe I could do it before I did it. And so the mindset books were very important for me. I completely agree. It's it's that opening us up to possibility. I mean, when I actually moved out of the pure marketing strategy world and started, much similar to you, um, embracing and exploring the personal development side of things and started looking at you know, subjects from a different perspective, from that concept yeah. that you can create, from that yeah. concept that there are universal laws that are there to support us. Yeah. I haven't, you know, chucked out the strategy. I mean, that's definitely a part of it. It needs to be a part of building any business, yeah. but there's more to it. And I absolutely believe the mindset piece is vital. I invest in a, in a mindset coach, but I also never stop reading about that yeah. part of the work because you know thoughts become things as uh, as Mike Dooley says in the in the law of attraction area thoughts become things so let's make those thoughts good ones exactly yeah for sure <laughs> beautiful well Emma thank you so much for spending your time here with us today there's been just the journey that you've been on and seeing how you've you know popped from one opportunity to recognizing another one taking that deep breath and moving forward and, and expanding your skills and, and seeing the transferability yes. <laughs> shall we say transferability of those of those artistic skills into another area and continuing to expand those possibilities because you do work on your mindset and you yes. do stay positive and you do, you know, there are, there are doubts and demons that hit us along the way, but we can respond to those challenges rather than react to them. And then yes. that can allow us to really build something that's sustainable and enjoyable. Absolutely. Well, I've loved chatting with you as always, Angela. Uh, so thanks for having me on the podcast. You're so welcome. And if um, our listeners would like to come and find you in the world, if they want to get one of those gorgeous backdrops or if they do want to have a flourish of artistic ability coming into their branding, where can we find you in this big wide world? You can find me at bespokebackdrops.com. Um, that's my website. And then on Facebook, Bespoke Backdrops as well. And I'm always, I do my own social media. So I'm always there. Always happy to have someone message me. It's all good. <laughs> Yeah, I know from experience that you respond very promptly. So, hey, we may have opened a can of worms here, <laughs> but I'll make sure I'll, <laughs> I'll make sure those links go onto the um, the page for your episode as well. And I'll also put links through to the books that you talked about because it's always great to get a good recommendation. And I've read the ones that you've been talking about as well, and absolutely agree. Denise Duffield Thomas, um, Lucky Bitch. At first, the the title I was like, ooh, felt a yeah. bit like triggered by the title, but it's yes. a great attention grabbing title and if you can let go of that and dive into the content she's had she's an entrepreneur that I very very much 
um, admire in terms of how she has built her business and hearing that behind the scenes scenario of, of how she has worked on her own mindset and that helps so many other people as well. I think it's a definitely a great read. And of course the big leap. Yep. I actually, my own, I'm in a mastermind. I run masterminds, but my own mastermind coach um, reminded me that it's probably a good idea if I had another read of that one. So yeah, it's back on, it's back that. on my list. <laughs> yes, I do. We need to revisit it. <laughs> well, thank you, my darling. And you and I will talk again very yeah. soon. Okay. Thanks, Angela. And you're welcome. And you, my lovely listener, thank you so much for tuning in today to the Next Chapter podcast. Hopefully you've enjoyed this conversation with Emma. If there was any thoughts that the skill set that you have can't be turned into a viable business that has a sustainable income, this story today has shown you that it is absolutely possible. We have to respond. We need to plan. We need to respond. We need to look at opportunities and be ready to pivot. So hold that dream, hold that vision that you have for your business near your heart, but hold it loosely so that you can respond to the new ideas as they come forward. If we're too prescriptive in the way things must be, have to be, have to look, we're in that territory of the cursed hows, and you will miss things that could really enrich the way that you can grow and develop both yourself and your business. Now, I really encourage you to go and have a look at Emma's site. She does gorgeous work. Her backdrop, which I have in my own business, is right behind many of the videos that I run in my training courses. And I know she does absolutely beautiful work. But there's that branding side as well. And just hearing the story of how Emma is growing serves as a great inspiration for us all. So thank you again for spending your time here with this episode today. And I'll be back to you really soon with another wonderful story of possibilities, which unfold fold in your next chapter. So until then, take care. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Your Next Chapter podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please let me know. Pop over to AngelaRaspis.com to subscribe to the show and leave a review. And whilst you're there, you can also enjoy valuable free resources, including show notes and downloads, along with the Next Chapter community, where you can connect with other wholehearted women on the same journey as you. We'd love to welcome and support you as your next chapter unfolds. See you next time.